do it on the computer. Got it. Now it's recording. Okay, but no changes or additions. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from September 26th? So moved by Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Hi. Um, okay, Tina, Tina. second. Okay. Any um, discussion about the minutes? All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Minutes have passed. Uh, treasurer's report. So Bobby sent it to me. So I'm going to do my thing and hold it up, I think. Well, I was, I sent, I can just say what it says. I sent it to you because I didn't okay. know if you could share it on your screen, but it's not very complicated. We have 14 paid members. So our income for the year is $140. We don't have any expenses. And our balance is $1,629. Anybody have Hi, any Carmen. questions for um, Bobby? No, I'm assuming um, dues are gonna be January 1st. Um, we'll all need to send our $10 in again. Uh, um, is there a motion to approve Bobby's report? Patty? I make the motion. Okay. Um, second? Kathy? Okay. Okay. All those in favor of accepting, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay. Um, brainstorm future um, program topics. I sent you one by email. Um, on the on the um, survey that I sent earlier. Yes. Okay. Anybody have any hot topics that they need help with, or mm -hmm. have seen something out there they want to learn more about, or? something they want to lead and teach us all. I'd be interested in seeing how people recruit new employees because I'm not having very much luck. You're not alone <laughs> in the world. Well, in the Vermont. <laughs> I think in the world. Sarah, I, I know we talked briefly a little bit about maybe, maybe hearing from like the education committee because I know I struggle. Um, I asked you a few questions around education and not really knowing where to go from there. So I wonder if the education committee would talk to us. Oh, you mean about becoming certified and NEMC and all of that? Right, being new, yeah. I'm very confused all around that and like the next steps and what's involved. So I would love to hear from them. So there's actually four of us here at the meeting, coincidentally. Okay. So. Um, I think it would be great if we could come up with something for a future meeting. Super and you helpful. can always just call someone and ask. Um, okay. You know, we're, we're happy to walk people through it. It's, you know, when you've worked on something for a long time, it's pretty obvious to you. But when someone's looking at it for the first time, it could be confusing and it might actually help us um, streamline the application more. You know, we have had to change it as things have been confusing. But you know, I think our committee can talk and come up with something. Okay. Thank yeah, it thanks. Took, it took me about 15 years to start to understand <laughs> all the layers and things. Yeah. Yeah. I wish yeah. I'd, I'd wish I'd understand it sooner to collect. I was doing stuff, but not collecting mm. stuff. Right. Um, any other ideas that people have? And feel free to, if you have ideas after this or anytime um, something pops up, email Tina because she's our program coordinator. So email her thoughts. Um, so approve the 2023 meeting dates. So
So I sent out um, to the to the county members. I know there's people on here that aren't in the county, so I didn't send it to you. Um, the calendar, and I tried to be proactive because last year we set the dates, and it was the week of NEMSI and the week of the conference, and the mm -hmm. so um, I blacked out or I put in blue all of the conferences and NEMSI so that we could um, have those dates in mind when we were picking dates. We had, sorry, my dogs are gonna fight. Um, we had been meeting the third Thursday and the fourth Monday and rotating it. But some people have said some days are hard for others. Um, so I just am, as clerks have been retiring and we're getting new assistants and new clerks and just trying to figure out if that schedule still works or if we wanna try something new. I only got two responses on the, on the survey I sent out that um, were completely the opposite of each other for answers. So that doesn't help at all. Mondays are never good for me. So I think I said that. So is Thursdays good for most people? I just responded, uh, Sarah, like five minutes ago. <laughs> but and I, Tuesdays, I'm not Tuesdays and Thursdays are out for me. Okay. But if we're rotating, that's okay. We anticipate some of us missing some of them. <laughs> Has, do most meetings or select board meetings happen on a Wednesday? Is that why we never consider the Wednesday? No. Wednesdays my, are great for me. My select board meets the first and the third Wednesday. Ah. And my cemetery association meets on the second Wednesday. <laughs> so I could do the fourth Wednesday of the month. <laughs> wow, you you don't have any Wednesdays, Kathy. <laughs> I don't have a life. <laughs> <laughs> And in Morristown, we meet Mondays. And everybody has Friday night date night, so we can't do that, right? right. I'm not doing Fridays. <laughs> so, so, so then let me, let me put it out there. Is the fourth Wednesday agreeable? Or is there anybody that absolutely can't do the fourth Wednesday? I can. And we only meet four times a year. It's not every month. So, well, we we switched it to six times a year. Do we want it. So that's my other question. Do we want to go back to um, four, or do we no, want to like, keep it six? I like every other month. I think it keeps us in contact. Yeah, I have to say that I like the six. Yeah. And if we do it by Zoom, it's not like we're traveling a lot. Right. We need to have one face to face and dinner somewhere. <laughs> but that's a personal <laughs> preference. <laughs> Christmas party. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> but I have way too many of that stuff going on too. Um, as I'm looking at the calendar, there are no conflicts. On yeah. the fourth Wednesday, March has a has five Wednesdays, so the fourth one is the twenty second. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The fourth Wednesday seems to it fits into be the fine schedule. with with conferences. Right. Oh, okay. So, do I make a motion? We go with the fourth Wednesday every other month. February. Starting April, June, August, and October. Am I doing something wrong? So that's my question is, do we want to do it in um, January? We're in November right now. Oh, okay. So do well, we want to do sense. start in January or in February? Well, I would like to start in February, if you don't mind. I help putting, put the town report together and stuff, and we kind of, that's a busy month. 
So February, April, June, August, October, December. So that would be February 22. April 26, June 28, August 23, September 27. No, 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 September. no, September. no I'm my, my bad. <laughs> October 25 and December 27. Or but maybe nobody's, nobody's going to want to do the December one. Right. We could skip that one. We could. Yep. Okay. So we'll do five times. Yeah. Okay. So Belinda made the motion. Somebody want to second it? Patty, any more discussion? Um, just one more thing. Are we going to continue at five o'clock, five thirty? What did we? What do you? Yes. Want to do? Great question. Because we had been doing Zoom starting at four thirty, and then we thought we were meeting in person, so we made it this one later to give people time to travel. So um, we could do four thirty. If we're going to continue on Zoom, is that the easiest to do it straight after work? Yes. Okay. And so then, th therefore, we're agreeing to do them by Zoom. I would think at least through the winter, and then oh, we yeah. can come back um, and see once we get through the winter. If maybe in, maybe in June it's nice, and we or August, we've always talked about having a summer one someplace, but we never can seem to get the turnout. But we've always talked about, can we go to a lake or somebody's park and yeah. have a picnic? We'll plan on Zoom unless we have a date, unless we choose on the later date. Mm -hmm. At 4.30. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passed. Now we're gonna um, have our program portion of the meeting. And Patrick Healy is here, who is the president of the Vermont Cemetery Association. And he is going to talk to us about cemeteries. Joining us, Patrick. Alrighty, thank you. <laughs> cut, my, cut me off. Can uh, I, did you make Bobby able to share the screen? Linda, do you know how to do that? Yep, we're doing it right now. How do I do that? A little arrow. Okay. Should be able to. Multiple? No, one person was fine. Oh. Okay. Whoops. Who's the host of the We are. Who's we? Uh, Wolcott. Are you logged in with Wolcott? Yes. That's Wolcott. I'm town admin. Okay. Hold on a second. You know, technical difficulties here. I have no idea. So <laughs> there we go. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you um, for inviting me. Um, before I start, I just want to give you my email and my telephone number if you have questions. Um, my email is Patrick, P A T R I C K H. The number is 468 at gmail.com. Telephone number, cell phone is 802. 272-6957. All righty, I put in, uh, so I'll send, I sent these notes to Tina and to Bobby, maybe they can forward them to you. Um, <clears throat> what I, these are the questions that Tina had forwarded to me and I wrote down some stuff in black. Um, it may be just notes, so you may think, what does this mean? But it, it just helps me answer the question. 
Um, <clears throat> to begin with, I am not an attorney. I'm a New England, a New England um, Cemetery Association certified cemetery and with 36 years of experience. I have a um, undergraduate degree in horticulture and a graduate degree of uh, master's of public administration. Um, and um, the 36 years of experience is starting from scratch. Um, and I'm sure that's what a lot of you have done um, coming into your jobs. And like I tell Bobby, if the town clerk is not happy, nobody's happy in town. Um, so control of what is going on in a cemetery is crucial. Just keep that in mind. You really, the cemetery commissioners need to know um, what's going on um, in controlling who does what. Um, so the first question that was um, given to me, what should we do if someone wants to sell their lot because they no longer need it? What if they bring in a deed or other paperwork showing that a lot has been sold, purchased without town, the town being involved? This is where your rules and regulations need to come into play. You need to have in your rules and regulations how someone can sell their, their lots. And what I, my advice is have them sell them back to you for what they paid for, minus the perpetual care fee. So if they sold it 20, if they bought the lot, a four grave lot, let's say 20 years ago for $1,000 and 500 of it went towards perpetual care, they only get 500. Um, even though today that, that four grave lot may be $4,000, they, they can't profit. It's against the law for private people to um, private gain in a cemetery. And that's why you don't see, um, you can't speculate. You can't buy a bunch of graves and then hold on to it. Um, so your rules and regulations need to address that. And if you're going to purchase them back, make sure nobody is buried in that lot. Because sometimes Uncle Charlie was put in the corner and no, and 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 wasn't marked because he wasn't liked, and and people forgot about him. Um, so you need to you need to know make sure. And then if there's a monument on the lot, um, so be really careful um, when people start trying to sell the lots to you. Um, when they go ahead and try to sell it to somebody else, that's their issue, and they really shouldn't do it. They should sell it back to you, and then you trans you sell it to the new person. Um, I put down uh, Title 18, Chapter 121, Subsection 5303. You can take a look at that. Um, family can go to probate? Question mark. Sure. Often um, you can steer people to probate. Um, court, they can, uh, the judge can uh, decide, they're the ones who regulate uh, ownership of, of cemetery lots, they can regulate uh, cemetery questions. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. The issue is that a lot of uh, probate court judges have very little experience in cemeteries, as most people in Vermont. So it's really hard sometimes to know what the statutes say. Um, Next question, what should we do if someone says their grandparents, aunt, whatever, whoever bought a lot, but they can't find the deed and we don't have a copy recorded, but we know the records are not complete. Uh, my answer is no deed, no action. Um, people, are you have a question, Kathy? I can't see the bottom of the screen. Can you roll it up a little bit? Because I, I, I like to follow along with your outline and it's not showing. Can you scroll that up a little bit? We'll try. Thank you. Oh, yeah. that's good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So they can go to. Um, let's see. Let's start that again. What? Uh, what should we do if someone says their grandparents, aunt, whoever bought a lot but can't uh, find the deed? Um, no deed, no action. Because the deed is a piece of paper. It's an instrument, and you can easily sign it off to somebody else. And if they don't have it, how do you know that grandpa didn't? give it to the neighbor um, or whatever. So you can't, you, you just, you just can't do it. Um, and then there's a little bit about talking about heirs and if there's an issue and the heirs have 17 years and I don't know where the 17 years come from, but they can come back and get um, to an established claim and then be paid for that claim. 
Um, again, you know, probate court is something that um, can, may be able to help you out there. Um, the next question, the town took over responsibility for a family cemetery decades ago. Families are still allowed to be buried there. What is the town's responsibility when two family members want the same lot? Our written agreement states that we will provide perpetual care, but it doesn't address this situation. Again, I, um, I think you need to go to the next page, okay. my, my assistant. Sorry, I'm falling down on the job. <laughs> I lost where I was. All righty, so I'll say that one again. Um, the town took over responsibility. I don't know what I'm sharing. All right, we'll get it. Fair, can you see that? Mm hmm Great, can you move it up just a little bit? Oh, no. what did you do? It's very sensitive. My screen sharing is paused. I don't know why it's paused. All right, great. But you need to, yes. Thank you. Perfect. I'm not going to touch right. again. Okay, so the town took over responsibility um, for a family cemetery. If it's not in there, I, I don't know why people can't work things out. But as we all know, families can um, can, can be real pain in the butts. Um, so what I would do is try to write something up as a rule and regulation for that cemetery, um, and it should be first come first serve. So what I mean by first come first serve is either first come to reserve or first one to die gets what they want. Um, so the best thing to do is to figure out who's left in the family and just say we need a master plan of who's going where. Um, and um, I, I think that's the best that you can do or tell them to go to probate. Um, what is the difference between home, home burials and green burials? If somebody wants to be buried at home, is that automatically a green burial or do funeral directors conduct burials on private land? Um, there's a lot in that question. Um, let me break it down here. The types of burials that you have are the old ones were in a pine box and they were four to five feet deep. Then you went to, uh, and they could have been embalmed like in, during the Civil War. Civil War is when embalming began. Then they started to use vaults, concrete vaults or concrete liners, and liners are just a, a vault that's in sections around World War II, 1940s, um, then into the 1950s. Um, now we're talking about green burials, um, which is only three and a half feet deep, all natural components, no embalming, no concrete. Um, so a home burial can be any of those. It could be a green burial. It could be a cremation burial. It could be a burial that's in a vault. Um, so th there's no, there, it, it, that's the difference. Um, and if somebody wants to be buried at home, um, the issue that I see, that I have seen a lot, probably about a dozen times, is that when they go to sell the land, nobody wants to buy the land with, with the body buried on that property. Because by law, I believe there's a law someplace on the books 
says you have to grant permission for the family to visit that grave when they want to. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, do green burials have to be separate, separated from traditional burials? Uh, my answer is no, because I'm assuming you mean separate areas. A family lot could contain a vault burial. It could contain an urn and a green burial, as long as they're in separate graves. What is the duty of the town clerk in the operation of cemeteries? Is it different if there's a commission? No. Clerks are the record keeper and the one that gets the, all the headache questions and complaints about cemeteries. Nothing different. If there is a commission, that's, yeah, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no difference if there's a commission. Um, what documents are required for record keeping and preservation? Preservation, I believe you have to always have a paper copy someplace. Um, you keep it on the computer. Um, the town clerk will keep the records of the lot maps, the lot purchases, the burial permits, the death certificates, and the other vital records. The town treasurers keep the financial records, and uh, I know that a lot of you are both, um, including any and all the tr trust uh, perpetual care funds. Um, yearly audits are recommended. I wrote that in because some cemeteries have never been audited, and it's really a important tool that they should uh important task that they should they should perform kathy has a question oh okay go ahead kathy thank you um so belvedere has a cemetery association i'm the town clerk and treasurer and my question is um when a lot is sold the president brings me a little piece of paper to keep on file, and I have a scary hand-drawn map. But what makes this a little more complicated is I'm the town clerk and treasurer in Belvedere, but I'm also the president of the cemetery association. And I'm concerned about me as the keeper of the records as town clerk, but the the town treasurer doesn't have any of those funds, and I'm assuming that that's okay because there's a commission, there's a Belvedere Cemetery Association, and all of the funds are private. The town is not aware of any of that stuff, and it's not necessarily safe or locked up or, or viewed by anybody else because the, the cemetery association has complete control of all of that stuff. Is so, that? So the association is not a public association, correct? Well, <laughs> we have to get together. <laughs> yes, okay. Yep. If, if they have, if they operate under the town's tax ID number, the treasurer should have the funds, the town treasurer. If they have their own tax ID number, they are separate. Well, and, and they have to report to the IRS each year. Well, and that's part of my concern. Sure. And you're not alone. It, it happens all over the state. Um, small towns, small cemeteries. Nobody knows what's going on. <clears throat> nobody really knows what's going on until something blows up. Um, and then it's, um, yeah, so we should get together. But, my, but just to, uh, quickly, my advice would be to to work with them and get get the town to at least hold the records in the vault for the association. Well, it, it, as it turns out, this is a lot. You know, I am the town clerk and treasurer for Belvedere. I am the president and the treasurer for the cemetery association. So I have all that stuff locked up in the vault, but I'm not going to be both of those for forever. And that's Correct. why I want to try to get this business straightened out before I die or before I retire, whichever comes first. So that's why I would like to, we can have this conversation. And definitely I need to have more time with you, Patrick, in my office because I have lots of questions. Okay, great, great. Um, let's see, where were we? Um, so cemetery personnel or that could be the association or the town personnel uh, or, the, or the commissioners 
They should keep the remainder of the documents, such as any correspondence, monument warranties, monument work permits, if you have them, um, and the lot layout, and you know who's buried in which lot. Um, that you can get really specific, but I don't believe the city clerk has to have that. I think by when I was looking through the statues, they just have to know of the lot maps, the lot purchases, the burial permits, the death certificates. And, um, so, and, and just to, as a note, if you're looking for a source for personal information on families, funeral directors are a great source. And they, they often will write up what's called a clergy record. And that clergy record is they give that to the clergy so that when the clergy's performing the service, they know who's married to who or whatever. But on that clergy record often are contact numbers and addresses. And more information you can have on the families, the better. Because when something comes up, you can, you know, um, you can look into their file. Um, but we can, you know, um, and what I normally do is I just try to keep everything in, in, a, in a folder that, a file folder that has the sides. I don't know what those are called. They're enclosed. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a technical person, so I'm, all of my stuff is um, all paper um, because we don't have anyone in the office that can, um, that, that's there, that could even have the time to type everything in, onto a computer. So um, that's the type of documents that, that you should have. Preservation, whatever the uh, Secretary of State calls for. Um, if somebody wants to move a body from a private cemetery to a public cemetery, what is the process? I would first recommend call a funeral director um, because they need to get, the step one is they need to get a removal permit. And I showed you the title 18 chapter 107 subsection 5212, um, show what the process is. There's, there's, two pro, there's two parts or there's two different processes. You can get permit if you get written permission from everybody in the family of that person that is being moved. And that means parents, brothers, sisters, and children. And all as long as they're adults at the time of removal, not at the time of burial. Um, that's why I, I tell people, especially if it's coming from a private home, contact a funeral director. Because first of all, you don't know how that burial was performed. You don't know if they're in a concrete vault. If they're not in a concrete vault, then it's going to take some time. Um, and uh, I think I wrote down, uh, if, if, you're, if you're doing a removal in your cemetery and they're moving it to another cemetery, we charge over, the, over double the amount of a regular burial because it is a lot of work. Um, you're going to dig a grave two to three times the size of a regular grave to get that box, casket, or whatever out. Um, and I often find out why they want to move the body. And, and I, I mentioned it earlier, I believe. It's because they want to sell a property. And so my advice, and, and there's a question later on about um, private, private cemeteries. My advice is, is, is no. Um, Unless you're willing to set up a corporation where there's money involved and that you know that land cannot be um, developed, that you should use a, a cemetery, either public or religious cemetery. Um, so the process, though, just to know about um, the um, private, the removal process. You can, there's one, one process is if you get everyone to sign um, an affidavit um, saying that they have permission to move this person to so-and-so, you don't have to advertise it in the paper. There's another process that you have to advertise it, and, and I've never used that one. Um, and again, I'm going to say this can be messy, both, le both with the paperwork and with the um, with the actual um, removal. Um, the first of all, I think I might, I might have forgot to say is you need to know, you need to get a copy of the tree and you need somebody from the family to notarize it. 
because again, you need to know about Uncle Charlie that might be saying, no, you're not moving my brother. Um, and you need to know, and, and once they, often, once they know that everyone has to give permission, they say, never mind. Um, so it, it can be, it can be tough. Um, let's see, person, uh, again, you know, if they can use a funeral director, use a funeral director. Um, do it yourself burials. Can you speak about this? Um, if this is in your cemetery, um, I say no, um, absolutely not. You can let the family assist in filling the grave in, but you've got standards. You want to make sure that it's being done right. Um, and I would say no. It's kind of like going to a restaurant saying, hey, can I use the kitchen for a few minutes and can I make my own meal? But I'm only going to pay you five dollars because that's all you paid for for the you know for the the piece of meat. But I'm not going to pay you anything more. Um, so no, don't don't allow that. You're gonna you're asking for liability issues. Um, <clears throat> burial transit paperwork completion process. Can you speak of this? I'm I'm <clears throat> was a little I questioned what that meant. I mean. When the burial transit permit comes to you, it should be filled out by somebody from the cemetery. What the, but to know about the burial transit permit, before, once a body has been declared dead, you, you need a permit to move that body to wherever. If it's to a funeral home, if it's to a cemetery, if it's to a crematory. So the burial transit permit is obtained, funeral directors are agents, so they can do it themselves or they get one from you. But for you, for a clerk to give a burial permit, you need to see the death certificate. Um, you also need to make sure that the person that is getting that has permission from the family. So for today, uh, today I was working on one with the um, city clerk of Montpelier and um, he had told them to call me and I went back to, to talk to him about it. And um, they wanted a permit, but the per person wasn't dead for yet. Uh, well, they're gonna die today. He said, we just wanna get this going. And you can't start the process <laughs> until the guest of honor is dead. And then you need a medical examiner to, to certify that everything is okay. And what these, the, the plan um, for this, these friends were, I guess, was to take the body to the crematory in St. Johnsbury. Uh, but before they do that, they needed a burial transit permit and they need a certificate permit from the medical examiner saying it's okay to cremate the body. Because once you cremate the body, there's no evidence. And then in Vermont now, you have to wait 24 hours before a body is cremated after they're dead, not before, but after. Um, so there's, there's um, some time there. So the burial transit permit basically follows the body to the final spot of disposition. So it would either follow it to, um, to the cemetery or it follows it to the crematory or it follows it to the winter vault. So we have a winter vault in Montpelier um, and we will hold bodies for other cemeteries. Um, and so the funeral director will, uh, because they're an agent, they will fill out a burial transit permit to go into the vault. Then when it's time to come out of the vault, I've already given that permit to our town clerk. They will fill out a permit to come out of the vault. And then, then they'll fill out another permit to, that contains coming out of the vault and going to the final site of disposition, wherever that may be. Um, and so that's the process of the burial transit permit. Um, next. Oh, wait, I have a question. Yes. So we get burial transit permits when bodies are buried in Marshfield, but if someone dies and they're cremated, the burial transit permit ends up at the town where the crematorium is. What should we get for documentation when the ashes come to be buried? Um, I believe on the newer burial transit permits, there's 
spot where you can write down cremation. What we do is we um, have the, the cremation certificate given to us and we fill out, you know, the lot number um, and um, type of urn and whatever. And we use that as the burial transit permit. Um, but the, the state of Vermont right now looks at cremation as the final um, form of disposition. So they're not, they're not, they have yet to mandate that the uh, burial transit permit stays with that cremation. So you just make up some other kind of record? I just use the cremation certificate saying, okay, Patrick Healy and lot number so and so buried two and a half feet deep. He's in a granite urn or he's not in an urn or whatever, um, and marked with, a, with his marker. Um, but you need to have some type of identification uh, of who's in that, who those cremated remains are. Um, okay. I have another question too. Sure. Um, I haven't received any burial permits in several years. Who has it? You this is Kathy, Kathy and Belvedere. I know bodies are buried in the Belvedere Cemetery because I've gone to some of the funerals, but I haven't received any burial permits from the Sexton for several years. Well, um, he needs to um, uh, he needs to bring his permits into the city clerk once a month. And what um, if he doesn't? Well, then I would give him a telephone call and say, "Hey, what's what's going on?" Um, but Who does that? You need Who's to your sexton, Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, it our former sexton? I don't know. It's a former resident of Belvedere oh, who, now, who now lives in another town, but he's the one who takes care of all the burials. He prepares the ground and he does all of that. And I know he has the permits, but he just doesn't bring them in. I, have, I haven't received a permit from him for several years. Burial yeah. permit. You should be talking to the funeral director too. And you could what? also you could also talk to Visara and see if they have any advice because those are public records, those are town records. So our issue was our sexton was also the funeral director who was not bringing me anything for years. Is he out of business now? Yeah. 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 Imagine that. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and unfortunate, well, or fortunately, there's no cemetery police. So nobody's checking on any of us on this. We, we, we just need to follow the, the state law. Um, burial, okay, burial change. Last, I think I'm on the last page, yes. Okay, best practice for cemetery lot deeds when transferring ownership of lots. It's a good question. Is a transfer between family or non-family members? If it's family, um, and if mom and dad are already buried and they're the, the original owners, sometimes um, children, grandchildren want a new copy of a deed to show that they're owners. Um, you, you, can't, you can't redo the deed. Once the deed is written, it's written out to the original ones that buried or, or purchased it, and they can, by will, give it to somebody else. So you can't make up a new deed. Um, you can just work with the family on that. Um, and um, again, you can go to the probate judge and ask what their thoughts are. If it's not a family, um, always buy back the lot and sell it. Um, either way, you need to have the original deed. And so I have seen deeds that were 100 years old coming to me at, the, at Green Mount, and they're the original deed. And people kept them uh, but they could play you know they could sign them over to somebody uh, we never made copies because 100 years ago they didn't have copy machines um, so one one idea that many cemeteries are doing especially big cemeteries in the cities is when a deed gets um, recorded or written up it places it tells who has the burial rights in that lot and what grave they're going into it's basically a master plan. Everyone knows right from the start who goes where, no questions asked. Because as you know, you get some divorces and, and um, other marriages and it can become quite the, quite the mess. Um, 
Let's see. Green burials, private cemeteries, should we encourage them or not? Um, I wouldn't, as a clerk, I wouldn't um, encourage either one. I would just stay neutral, but voice your concerns about uh, um, what, what can happen with private cemeteries. A lot of people, it's kind of being the thing to get buried on your own land now. And um, what I have found out, as I said a couple of times, when you go to sell that land, people don't want a body buried there. People expect, I had um, a pretty famous person that uh, his urn was, pl um, was placed up in a pine forest that he had owned. Um, the family sold it a few years later and they were promised that the, you know, the trees would not be cut while the price of pine was really high and, the, and so they had it clear cut. So when the family went back to visit the grave, the forest had been um, destroyed in their mind. And so they moved his urn from, from that spot to, to Greenmount. Um, so again, um, I, I would just tell people what they're getting into when they wanna be buried on their own land. Um, the association has looked at it. We've talked about it, um, and we're, we're going to get going again on meetings this spring. We haven't had one for a couple couple years, and uh, that is an issue that we should be talking about: is how many home burials there are out there, and uh, if there's any issues. Um, Act 84 was approved on March 22nd regarding cemetery payment and investment. It's uh, the perpetual care fund. Um, the bill proposed was, was proposing to allow cemetery associations to manage perpetual care funds. And the cemetery association or, cemetery, you know, either town or private, um, manage perpetual care funds in, in accordance to, with investment policies adopted by the cemetery association. What, um, and then it's need or should be done by a fiduciary instead of someone that's not a fiduciary. Um, the rate, what it was, was the ratio of stocks to bonds was 35 to 60. That has been eliminated. So it's allowing cemeteries to do a little more um, aggressive investment if they want to, but they need to have an investment um, policy and they need to have a fiduciary looking, at, looking over it not just a, a bank, I don't believe is a fiduciary. Um, how do you go about updating cemetery association bylaws? Uh, my, my advice would be to first research what other cemetery association bylaws are. Um, you can check in with the Secretary of State's office. Most of, most of the bylaws have been registered with the Secretary of State's office. Um, and I would, I would be checking with an attorney. And then you want to make sure that you properly warn the process um, as much as possible to make sure that nobody is, you know, if, if anyone has a comment or complaint, they, you know, they can be heard. Um, how are land records created for cemetery plots that have been purchased? Um, if you look at the cemetery statues, if it's a town cemetery you're going to keep the um keep a map you're going to keep the copy of the you should keep a copy of the deed and that's probably how i would record it in the land records instead of the cemetery in addition to cemetery records you would have a copy of the deed and a copy of the lot map or at least um, a note of where that lot map is found if it's on page so and so or glide so and so or or file so and so, at least they can find it. It's just like a, a piece of of land. Um, and just keep in mind that people are not actually buying the land, but they're what they're really doing is they're buying the rights to be buried on that piece of property. Um, what systems are, are in place for selling and documenting plot sales? If it's a computer system, I don't know. There's many out there. They've been out for a while. I think uh, most people that are small cemeteries are making up their own system. Um, but it's, um, again, um, I think you can do it on a spreadsheet. Uh, um, so you can make up your own. 
Um, and um, that's it there. I just want to say, um, there's my number is there. You can call me anytime. Um, join, um, get your association, your, your town to join the cemetery association. We're going to have a meeting this winter and spring, probably in Montpelier. Um, now that COVID's over, there's a lot to go over. Um, but people, as you know, there's a lot to learn about the cemeteries. Everything from record keeping to how to invest your perpetual care to actually how to make a contract with people that are doing the burials um, oh, and, and pricing and so on. What other questions do people have? Yes. So my question is, um, recently um, here in Wolcott, we had an association, we had a commissioners, five commissioners, town commissioners uh, for the cemetery. And they decided because the same five commissioners were running the association, they decided to do away with the association because the association was a separate entity that had to was required to report to the IRS yearly and hadn't uh, reported for five years. And there was they were looking at penalties and fines and stuff. So the IRS gave them a way out of that um, to uh defunct the association and give everything back to the commissioners to the town and so now we just have the one entity which is the town that runs the cemetery but they changed some of the bylaws because one of the things they found with the association is in their bylaws it said that the people had to buy their corner posts at the time that they purchased the lots but most of them never did and it became a problem figuring out other than on the map, what, who owned what. So the commissioners wrote it in that they, um, in their amount that they charged per lot, that there would be four corner, corner posts uh, purchased by the town to be put in uh, at the time. Okay. My question is, is that legal? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, and a lot of towns do that. Um, and there's there's other ways. I mean, there there are aluminum markers that you can get that are much less expensive than the granite ones. Um, but they should be all pinned and marked. And maps should be on a mylar. It should be just like recording a subdivision of of a property. It should be the same same type of map that people can come in and clearly see exactly how this design is. And then you've got to have a log someplace on who owns what lot. So. Um I was going to say that um, we have um, this, a cemetery booklet on our website and um, we modeled ours on stoves. Um, and what happened was um, when somebody buys a cemetery lot, I hand them the book. So the only thing that isn't in the book are the rates because we didn't want to have to keep um, changing the printing book. the thing. So I, I tell people or the, you know, the, our employee tells people, but it's worked really well. And it kind of, you know, we have the maps and we have all kinds of fun stuff in there. So um, if you go to huntingtonvt.org, you can find it and um, it's a PDF and it's available online. And I also had a bunch printed. They're not cheap. So I, you know, I wouldn't send them to all of you, but um, you're, you're welcome to look at them. Great, and and thank you for mentioning Stowe, Heidi, because at one point um, Stowe was really uh, in tough shape as far as record keeping and and who ran the cemetery and who was doing what, where the money was going. And there's a woman named Joy Joy Fagan that had just joined on, and she had no idea what was going on. And she worked with us, uh, with the association, and, and, and got them to go above and beyond what a lot of cemeteries were doing. And she modeled a lot of things out of, um, she had gone to the New England Cemetery Association meetings and gone to where the, you know, Boston and stuff where they have a lot of forums and, you know, they have a lot of, but, and, and she was able to turn the place around. So I'm glad that you looked at that. I'll have to take a look at yours and it's really good. The website um is really a good place to to find stuff um especially with stowe and, and one thing that i'll be working on is, is an operations manual for 
uh, for Green Mound, but it'll be for you know cemeteries in general. And uh, I hope to have that done within a year. And uh, because as you know, there's no book on cemeteries. Right. There's none. <laughs> and you just have to ask. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so we had a situation this week where um, somebody has died and the daughter who um, is the only heir apparently had, wants to sell back the lot because they um, cremated the dad and buried him someplace else. So they're never gonna use the lot. So they had contacted the association about the association buying it back. They, um, we've now found that the deed was written incorrectly. So it's the wrong deed information to begin with. So it needs to be corrected. But um, she doesn't want the lot. She wants to sell it back, but nothing was ever done through probate. There's no executor. There's no any, you know, anything. So trying to figure out if, um, we can allow her to sign documents to sell it back to us or not because it's the wrong deed to begin with because it has the wrong information. That's a good question. I would I would uh, put it right to probate and I would to the uh, and and I would also send it to the Secretary of State um, and okay. say what are your thoughts because this um, so it sounds like if there's no. I guess if there's, yeah, find out from probate. Because, okay. you know, everything could have been in her name or they had no no money at all. There was no, he died with absolutely no money and nothing went through probate. Yeah, so I, I would check with probate just to get somebody that's neutral that can okay it. Um, okay. But again, check with the secretary of state. And again, uh, you do know the original purchase price, correct? Yes. Yeah, and that's what, you know, don't don't so, don't pay them anymore. So when you say Secretary of State, what what office, what department, who? Um, I usually just send it to the Secretary of State, or who's the what's the assistant position called? Uh, deputy. 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 Okay. And um, and let me know what your you know what the answers are. I would be. Interesting. Okay. As often what I have found um, is that when someone dies and there's not a lot of money or the heirs need some money, they look at what the cemetery prices are today and they want to sell back one or two graves. And uh, it's like, no, sorry, we're not touching it. We also, in our when we updated our our cemetery rules, we put something in there that if they want to sell it back to the town, we will give them the original purchase price minus a fee because we have to do a new deed, and that takes some time. So we charge I think fifty dollars. And that fifty dollars goes to to the town, not to the association. Yeah, to to the well, they have every time I suggest that people decide they don't really want to do it. So I guess I haven't really figured out where the money would go. I think I would put it back in the cemetery fund. So any go ahead. So if the parents die, say there's eleven lots, we have a situation here. Um, the parents have died and one of the daughters has come forward and has had her son cremated and wants to put him in one of the lots. Do we have any say in that at all of what, if it happens or not? Oh, sure. It's considered a burial and you should have an appropriate price for it. Um, we charge um, in, uh, $490 to bury a, a cremated remains. Um, but but does she have to prove that she has a right to right. be in that lot if it was the parents' lot? So, so this is a grand, grandchild? The daughter wants to put her son, who's died, the grandson, in uh, the lot. They have 11 lots, and they've only used three. 
Yeah, so what I would do is I, I would first talk to her and say, let's get a master plan. Let's figure out who's going to get what lot, and then they themselves can figure out who's going. Um, cremation rate is about 80% right now. So um, I don't know what your rules are for as far as how many urns can go, or if you need an urn, how many cremated remains can go in a grave. Um, four. Four. Yeah, that's what we use. So I would say let's figure out a master plan now. Now that is, you know, um, before we do any burials, let's figure out for the rest of the people. How many kids are in the family? There are three children. Um, but there's no there's no will. Yeah, I, 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 I know that. And that's that's that that can be somewhat of an issue. But if you can get the family all together and figure out a master plan, even if, the, and, and you know, say um, one uh, grave one goes to Debbie and grave two, uh, one for Debbie and her husband, one and two, and just find out what they want and just say, let's get this figured out because it's just gonna get more complicated down the road, um, especially with grandkids and, you know, if there's divorces and it's just like, all right, let's, let's just get a plan. Let's work together here <laughs> and um, figure it out. And can you allow, if there's two buried bodies, a cremation on top of each? I'm sure if your rules um, do that. So because we're running out of land, um, many, probably 25 years ago, we established that in a two grave lot and a two full burial lot, you can actually bury 10 people. Um, two wow. caskets and then um, eight cremations. Um, because we, we don't have, we don't have land to sell. Um, right. and we want to reuse these. We, we want to keep income coming in and we're finding that a lot of people are retiring to Florida yes. and down there they're, they're getting cremated and they're going to some, someplace down there. And when, when I tell people, well, no, just come back to your family lot. There's always room. We'll figure it out. And then we're able to get that $490, um, and, and usually the people are very happy to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, you can, whatever your rules are. Again, cremation, um, the state of Vermont does, looks as cream, at cremation as the final stage of, um, of disposition. So they don't care if you spread them, what you do with them. But keep one thing in mind. Um, and it was told to me by somebody from the Department of Health many years ago, and her name was Pauline Dubuque. And she talked about, you don't need a permit to bury the cremated remains, but by all means, you better have a, a removal permit when you pull, if you pull those out, because you will create havoc among family members. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Kathy? So um, in my cemetery records, the deed has the name of the person who purchased the lot and not who they intend to put in the lot. So one family, my, my husband's family, they bought six lots. So on my map, those six lots are listed as owned by, you know, X, Y, Z. How do you determine who's actually in the lot? Well, again, I, I try to work it out with the family. And, and as you can, as you go on in, in selling of lots, a lot of cemeteries, and I think Stowe does, is has a master plan that will spell out exactly who's going where when. I uh, not when, but <laughs> who's, going, who's going where. Um, and um, that that's the issue. Um, and I believe that someplace in the statutes talks about uh, so if mom and dad die, the next person, if if it hasn't been um, probated or in the will of who gets it, if whoever dies first 
has the first right to be buried in the lot. It's not the oldest son that has the rule of the of the lot um, or the oldest um, daughter. Um, so that's why it's really important to figure out who's who's going to be going there when they buy when they purchase the lot. Okay, so then if this family has six lots, and I'm and I'm. You know, all I know is that there are six lots, but our cemetery association decides how many people can be buried in one lot. I was a little confused when you said you can put as many as, would you say, six people in one lot? Uh, in one grave, we, we allow five. So if one, one casket, one full burial, and then four cremations. And what we uh, um, we don't allow any more than one or two markers for that lot. We don't want a brick patio of markers. So what we try to get people to do is to plan on uh, putting names just on the monument. Um, so there are ways if if you can put it in your your law your rules and regulations on where they go. Um, so so in this case, if there's six lots by this one owner and again they're all six lots are in this one person's name right they could technically put I, i'd have to look at ours but say i think our i think the rules for the belvedere cemetery association is you can put one casket in two urns okay so technically in those six lots there could be 18 people okay okay will now, it ever happen no Probably not. And the other thing is, um, my husband, who never bought a lot, uh, his sister is offering to sell him one of her lots or give him one of those lots. And I recognize that there has to be some kind of a letter stating that Correct. Uh, in the records. But if he gets one lot, he could also put you can't put two caskets, I don't think. I think it's a, a a casket and an urn. But in one lot, if he gets one lot from his sister, he could literally do that. Is that correct? Does that sound like? That sounds yes. That sounds correct to me. Okay. All right. That's good. Um, is there a, some type of a legal document that needs to be written so that she can give this one of these lots to him? Well, I think it's a it's a notarized letter. Um, she may want to talk to an attorney, but you're you know she she really should be spelling out exactly what she's she's giving to him. If it's grave number one in lot six o three, um, section B, that's the way it should be uh, spelled right out. And and should it be something that's notarized? What if she doesn't yeah. contact an attorney? She Right now, the only record of these lots is in my office, and she wants to give her brother one of these lots because he doesn't have one, and it's in the family section. So she just writes a letter to the Belvedere Cemetery Association. Does she need to have it notarized? I, I would always have it at least notarized, sure. You know, someone should be witnessing that she is doing this without anybody pressuring her. And and to make this a little more complicated, I'm a notary. No, you, you I, I would have you step out of the picture. Okay, that's what I was going to say. I should not be involved as a notary at all. Okay, all right, that's fine. That and, will help. I mean, and I also think you shouldn't be involved as a cemetery person either. You know, it's best to remove yourself from the whole process. Well, of course, I'm the president of the cemetery association. I know, but you, you know, you have to, I think you have to step aside and let somebody else do this family business. Um, so I have a question. Lisa wrote something in the chat and I was wondering if you could explain to us what you're talking about here. Okay. Lisa from Stowe. You're on mute. Yep. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so we yes. have a form that we hand to the people that are buy, purchasing lots. And it's basically just a form that states who has burial rights there. 
Correct. So if both of, if both of the owners, say a couple purchase a lot, they have children, um, the parents die, the kids are like, well, you know, we don't, mom and dad are both cremated. They're in one plot. We don't want the other lot. It just helps with who actually can make a decision on what to do with who's being buried there or if they're going to sell it. Correct. And this is what Joy had set up way back when. Um, right. And I call it a master plan. Uh, it's, you know, it's an affidavit. It just says, you know, um, exactly who's going to go. Hopefully you have a, a map that's going to say who gets what. Um, but if you're not, at least you have who's coming. So that who's ever working at the cemetery or the, the town clerk's office can say, okay, they do have a son named Peter um, that lives out in California, but no nobody ever knew, but he does have a right to be here. So they're not running around going, well, who was this guy? Um, right. So, yeah, um, as I said earlier, Stowe has, has got a lot of great paperwork um, and it has helped them a lot. And a great cat. And a great cat. <laughs> What's a cat's name? Molson. Molson. Well, I won't ask why. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lisa, the affidavit of heirs is not necessarily who's going to be buried there, but who has permission to make decisions about who's going to be buried there? Right. Anything else? Carol, you're being awful quiet tonight. Are you, <laughs> are you sick? You're muted, so I can't hear you. <laughs> You're still muted. Her mic isn't working. Oh, your mic's. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to sing us a car uh, Christmas carol. Darn it. So, can I ask a, a professional question? Is there a list of um, we often get asked for monument people and, you know, we, we've had some mixed experiences with various, um, monument companies. Is there a place we can go to look and see if there are comments or anything, um, that would help, help us because, you know, our grave digger Robertson retired. And it's been kind of a struggle <laughs> to find someone. And then following up with that question is, if a stone gets knocked off the base in the cemetery, who's responsible for putting that back up if you don't know who did it? Um, we've come to the understanding that we're gonna just fix it ourselves because trying to figure out who did it and who's gonna pay for it can be a real pain. Um, <clears throat> as far as a list of people, monument dealers or grave diggers, you could check with the Barry Granite Association for monument dealers. As far as grave diggers, it's good luck. Um, but I know that Robert, you mean it was uh, Donnie Robertson from the vault company? Yeah, yeah. It's tough trying to find somebody to do it that you can trust and that you know that will do the right, do it the right way. I have a question. What is our legal obligation as far as perpetual care? Does that mean fixing broken stones, replacing broken stones, or does it mean just mowing the lawn? It depends on what your rules and regulations say that perpetual care or your deed uh, will say that the perpetual care will will take care of. Our deeds um, just say this deed includes perpetual care. Yeah, so it's the normal um, work. It's the normal maintenance of the cemetery. Now at Greenmount, long time ago, it was in the deeds that it would take care of the monuments. Then around, the, I think the 30s, they took, somebody took it out. And but if you set up, 
Then there's from another one next door. Here and going forward, if you can make sure that when monuments come in, they're properly, they have a proper foundation and they're properly set, um, they should last a long time. But you might as well just assume that you will be taking care of all of them. Um, we have in the last um, three years have gone through and straightened out um, well over 400 monuments. And these are big ones that we had to use cranes for. Um, and we just we just sucked it up and, and did it because it becomes a liability. We know that monuments leaning. If it leans and falls on somebody, then it's going to be you, you go to court. No one's going to win ex except for the lawyer. Um, and um, so you might as well just assume you're going to uh, have to fix it. And you that's why you have to make sure you're properly charging for perpetual care. Yes, Patty, um, that was, thank you for bringing that up. I'll bring that, um, I will need a list of the town clerk so that I will send an invitation to them, letting us, letting them know um, when we're having the meeting and what's on the agenda. And then that way you can relay it to your, your cemeteries in town um, because we do not have a mailing list of all the cemeteries. Um, so we often have gone through sending them to town clerks. I think what she's saying are our clerks invited to go to the meeting. Oh, sure. Not, are we gonna give it to our cemetery people? Well, uh, let, why, don't, why don't you do both? Give it to your cemetery people and yes, you will be invited. Always I, invited. I went a, a few years ago, my cemetery association actually invited me. It was one of the best trainings I've ever been to. I learned something in every single session. I was very okay. impressed. Super, thank you. That's great. Yes, Michelle. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, we have four private cemeteries. Um, the town does not own them. We just um, give appropriations to them every year. Um, and some of them are getting kind of rough, like the fences, I guess gates, I'm not sure. They're getting really rusty and the cost to fix them are is more than their budget. Um, what can the town, I mean, should the town just take that? I don't know, what should the town do in that instance to make it fair among all of them since there's only one of them that has a gate issue at the moment that's rusting away? Well, I would I would definitely talk to them and see, see what their future their, what their financial future for the cemetery really is. Um, what we're seeing, and, and I have seen for the last 30 some odd years, a lot of cemetery associations are being run by um, folks that are in their 80s and 90s, and um, they're not up to date on a lot of things. Um, we did have a ruling by, I think it was the deputy or the, the lawyer in the secretary of state's office many years ago, you don't have to have a fence around your cemetery. Uh, you don't have to put one up, but if you have one, you have you, sh you should keep it in, in good working order. Oh, you don't know Crassbury Common. They're pretty specific, <laughs> let me tell oh, you. It's Crassbury. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very old cemetery. And unfortunately there's not, um, I'm not sure how much space they even have to put in new or, graves. It's, it's almost full at this yeah. point. Um, the other thing is you can always get the word out that um, cemetery needs needs some money to fix up a fence, and you'd be surprised what people will and who will come out of and, and donate for it. Are there any grants that you might know of that helps with those kind of things for Vermont? You can check with the Vermont Old Cemetery Association and see what grants they have and how they can help. Um, Thank you. Um, one of the things while we're talking about fences, um, a person in our town put up a, a fence for their dogs. It was a four foot fence and um, they immediately jumped over it. And so they had this fence that um, they couldn't use and the company wouldn't take back. So they donated it to the cemetery and then paid for the additional fencing we needed. And um, 
At the time, they said it was an $18,000 donation, and it looks great. And of course, the first winter, somebody ran into it, drove away, and knocked down three sections. And it cost us $3,600 to replace the three sections. And what we found out was um, the town's insurance did not include fences. So you might want to make sure that if you are having any fence anything, <laughs> that your, your town's insurance through the League of Cities and Towns um, covers fences. Uh, that was a, a, a big hit on our account to have to replace that. Huh. The, other the other question I have for you, Patrick, um, and then I'll stop talking, is we have two old cemeteries that don't have a lot of stones in certain sections. And of course there are no records. So, the question is, can we use them or should we steer clear of that um, problem? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I would, um, first of all, get somebody in with ground penetrating radar to find out if there are burials there. Um, and then I would, I would go for, from there, get a map of where there could be potential burials um, and then uh, mark them out. And you may want to, if you send me an email, I'll give you the name of this woman who runs um, the, the dogs that sniff out bodies. Um, and I think she's in Fairfax. Um, and they actually came down and did a, did a um, cadaver, cadaver dogs. And they actually did a training at, the, at our cemetery one Memorial Day weekend. And they were going around sniffing out where, training their dogs to sniff out bodies. And um, I'd asked the guy, I think the professor would, I might've been from Arkansas or Tennessee that had come up. And um, this is all volunteer work that these dogs and owners do for folks, for uh, police um, departments and fire departments. And uh, he said they could smell a body that's been in the ground for 100 years, um, which was kind of amazing. And so it's it, that might help you a little bit. Um, and then I would get somebody with a ground penetrating radar. to It's kind of like a little push lawnmower. They go over it and they can they can tell where where a burial has occurred. Um, and then I would just get a map and say, all right, let's now that we have where there's potential that now we can start doing a little bit of digging investigation and see, but, um, cause you may end up seeing a lot of ledge and that's probably why they never went there. Do you have any suggestions or contacts of people or companies that will redo maps, modernize them? Our maps are old, ancient maps that really need to be drawn better. Yeah, what I would do is um, I would go on, on Google search. I would also look up New England Cemetery Association and see if they have any of their uh, supplier members and see if they list a, a map because I think there's a couple companies that can do that. But you're probably going to have to go to Boston or um, a bigger city to, to find it. We had, we had a local surveyor take our old paper map and make an exact duplicate on Mylar. She just did it in like measured. So we'll get recently had um, our annex uh, redone mapped and we did it with a local surveyor, Matt Reed, um, who did a great job. Good, good, yeah. All righty, if that's it, I want to say thank you for um, having me here tonight. Um, and again, you have my email, you have my um, 
cell phone number. So if you need to call me, just or email me questions, whatever, let me know. Thank you. All right. No, thank you. Thank you for all you do for the for the towns and cities. I know some days you're not smiling when you go home. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Much, Patrick. Um, is there any other business anybody wants to discuss? Kathy? Um, does anybody have a job description that they would like to share? I have no job description, so I have nothing to use when it comes to holiday. You know, I'm paid by the hour, plain and simple. And I'd like to create some kind of a job description, even though it's, you know. It, for I just, yourself? Well, for, to begin with, yes, for me. <laughs> so if anybody does, um, you know, I'd be happy to entertain looking at some of them to see if I can't create something for me to use with my town and my select board. Thank you. Belvedere. So, Kathy, you don't have a personnel policy for the town clerk? No. We got very little in the office for any policies. ELCT might be a good place to start. They have model personnel policies. Yeah, it, some of them can be very complicated. This is a small town with not much in the way of how to do this. So I've looked at their policies and, and I may go back and try again. I've even asked them, but. Um, I'd ask on the listserv, um, our VMCTA listserv, I would help you, but I'm salaried. And so I don't have anything specific. You know, I come and go as I please. And when I'm actually gone forever, um, the town owes me nothing. So, you know, it's that's a different kind of, situation. Well, that's kind of what I'm running into is um, I'm trying to make this a position attractive so that somebody wants the job. <laughs> <laughs> and right now I can't tell them anything except that I get paid by the hour and that's not even attractive. So I'm hoping for ideas, uh, I think, to, you know, for the future. <laughs> I don't have one either. When I first became clerk, I went to the town administrator and he actually advised me not to. He said, you're on salary and your job description is in state statute and don't sign and agree onto anything that's not in state statute. And that's a good, that's a good thing to remember. Uh, I, you know, the, the handbook for town clerks, I think is pretty outdated too. So, it doesn't help me when I want to um, try to find somebody to do the job. So, yeah, I guess I'll go look at the statutes and see what I can do. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for the suggestions and the, and the comments. Maybe we need to see who made the handbook. Was that Secretary of State's office? I think the it's the league. The league? Maybe yeah. we need to approach them and say, update the handbook. And I don't even think that Go they make it. it available anymore. So, <laughs> you know, I think they're recognizing some of their stuff is outdated too. So yeah, I'll, go, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll keep looking. <laughs> Any That's other it. business? Oh. No. Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Any discussion?